Hello everyone, this is Sarah from Hamilton. Today what I want to do is present a relatively uh, short video, God willing, about 15 minutes long, about the doctrine of the divine energies and some of the roots that I see for the doctrine of the energies in scripture. Before we get into this video, I just want to say that if you enjoy the content on this channel and wish to support the channel, you can do so by becoming a patron on a monthly basis. Uh, various kinds of patronage are available with different sets of benefits. You can see that in the link in the description box. Also, I offer a number of lecture sets answering Protestantism from the Bible, 17 hours, uh, answering Calvinism from the Bible, 6 to 7 hours, and uh, answering Judaism's rejection of Jesus, which is still expanding, but right now I believe is around 14 hours. I expect it will come to around 20 or 21 hours. You can purchase those all below. Uh, answering Judaism's rejection of Jesus uh, is at seraphimhamilton.com, and I'm working on getting all of the courses up there on seraphimhamilton.com. Um, uh, with all of that said, uh, let's just get into the main subject of this video. So uh, the doctrine of the divine energies in the last century and a half or so has really come to the fore in terms of theological discussions between Eastern and Western Christendom, though it has always had an important place in Orthodox theological tradition, contrary to uh, some academic presentations, uh, the writings and teachings of St. Gregory Palamas uh, were never lost within the Eastern Church. They had a special place in both the Greek and the Slavic Orthodox traditions. But especially in the 20th century, as Orthodox theologians moved from the collapsed uh, Russian Empire, now at that point the Soviet Union, and they moved to the West and came in contact with Western Christianity, they began to work to retrieve the Orthodox theological tradition and to present it to their Western counterparts in terms which would be both intelligible and philosophically precise. So this produced a number of related theological movements, among them the so-called Neopolemite movement. Today that word is used kind of as a pejorative. Um, I really think it's an important part of our uh, theological tradition. I think the most lucid exponent of the Polemite tradition and the implications of that tradition for robust Christian theology is Father Dumitru Staniloi, a Romanian Orthodox theologian who is undoubtedly a saint and I think undoubtedly is going to be canonized in the future. But what I want to do in this video is first present what the doctrine of the energies is, because there's a lot of misconceptions about the nature of the doctrine of the divine energies, and then I want to relate that to some common biblical theological themes. So what is the doctrine of the energy? So when you hear the word energy, you think immediately of this kind of vague, misty, new age idea that we all are vibrating on the same wavelength, you know, we're all sharing in some common energy. You might think of some bearded swami stretched out beside the Ganges River. That's not what the doctrine of the energy is about. It's about. In fact, the doctrine of the divine energies is firmly rooted in the classical tradition of Christian metaphysics, and it draws on the theological use of metaphysical terms which had been coined in the Platonic and the Aristotelian traditions. So the word energia is actually the Greek word actuality. So when Aristotle talks about the distinction between potency and actuality, when he uses the word actuality, it is energia. It is also closely related to the word ergon or work in the New Testament. So it is a very metaphysical, precise doctrine, which is rooted in the tradition of patristic metaphysics. So what I've tried to say here is that the doctrine of the energies really pertains to a pattern of being in relation. And I think more clear than talking about the distinction between the essence and the energies is talking about the threefold relation between essence, hypostasis, and energy. Because essence, hypostasis, energy are really the most important theological categories within which we can try to make sense of, to the extent that we can, uh, who God is, uh, based on his self-disclosure to us in the person of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. So, the energies is fundamentally, and at its core, a Trinitarian doctrine. It is a doctrine about God's existence being a relational existence. I've said being in relation. Uh, my friend Trey has called this communal ontology. Uh, famously, it has been expressed in the phrase being as communion by uh, Metropolitan John Zizoulis. Being in relation is what the energies are all about. So the essence or the nature is what something is. I'm a human being because I am an expression or a manifestation or a subsistence of human nature. 
I have the totality of human nature. And I'm a human being in the particular way that I am because I'm Seraphim Hamilton. So all these human qualities which I have are expressed in a particular mode. Uh, some people like to talk about an idiom. It's the idiomatic expression of those qualities I possess as a human being. So every human person has the same human qualities, but they express them in an irreducibly unique way. And that's called a hypostatic or a personal way. So the doctrine of the divine energies is related to the relation between essence and person. So what precisely does anything that I just said have to do with the idea of the energies? Well, think about it. What is an energy? What is an actuality? I hope you can see in the English sense of that word actuality what I'm talking about. We talk about a nature, and nature has no naked existence. It always exists in and through persons. And what does it mean to say the nature exists personally? What is the existence which a nature has personally? Well, the energies. Energies are the way in which a person exists. So if we say that humanity exists in and as Seraphim Hamilton, it's one particular mode in which the totality of human nature is expressed, what that means is those things which exist in me in virtue of human nature exist by and in the activities which I possess. So if you talk about my personal qualities, you know, the things which distinguish me as the distinct sort of person that I am, those are actually my activities. People might use any variety of adjectives to describe me, but if you think about those adjectives, they're actually energies. They're describing patterns of existence which a person um, uh, predicates of me <clears throat> in virtue of things in which I, uh, things I say, things I do, certain qualities which a person might think I have. Uh, pardon me. <clears throat> I'm still recovering from uh, an illness. Um, so forgive me for that. Um, so the energies are simply the way in which a thing exists. Or the, the energies are simply the existence of a thing itself. So the nature is the basis for the existence, the person is the mode in which that thing exists, and the energy or energies, I don't want to talk about the dispute between whether there's one energy or multiple energies, both of them are true in different ways. Um, the energy or, any, or energy is simply the existence of a thing, the mode of that existence is person, the basis of that existence is nature. So when we talk about the divine energies, what we're talking about is God existing as God. And God exists as God in three distinct ways or modes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Well, we know that because God has made himself participable uh, through his energies. And because every energy is rooted in nature, but also is expressed in personal terms, when we participate in the uncreated life of God, we participate in the uncreated life of God manifest to us in three distinct hypostatic modes, filial, uh, paternal, and spiritual. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We know that the God is three persons in the very same participation that we know that God is God, because the divine energies are the same divine energy, but always threefold. And what you should notice is that the three modes in which these energies um, exist are modes which can't exist without each other. But what does it mean to say that God exists or acts in a paternal way? What does it mean to say that the divine nature is realized in an irreducibly fatherly way. Well, that says something about the relation he has to his son. And if energy expresses and actualizes those things which are intrinsic to nature, if they actually constitute that nature as really an infinitely existent, and if they're constituted as personal modes, what that means is that for God to be God, he has to be the father of the only begotten son, so you need the only begotten son. So God's way of being is this relation between father and son. And in order to have that relation, you need to have the Holy Spirit. Because what does it mean to say that the father gives himself totally to the son? Well, he gives himself totally to the son in and through the person of the Holy Spirit, who is produced by the father and produced for the son. So he proceeds from the father, rests in the son. And in the interpersonal relationship among the three divine persons, the energy or the nature subsists and is fully 
and infinitely realized. And so the divine nature being fully divine and as the divine nature being infinitely realized must exist as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that that is the argument St. Gregory Palamas is making in 150 chapters, specifically chapters 35 to 37. We also say that the energies um, that energies are something which creatures have. Now, some people think about essence energies and they think, okay, so this is something which makes God God. It sets them apart from the creation. Um, God is essence and energies because he's so infinitely above us and they don't really think of essence and energies as something which is true just about anything. But actually it's true about anything. I have essence and energies, human nature, human activities, and it is my personhood which determines the mode in which those activities are realized. So my nature is expressed in the mode or idiom of my personal existence. So essence energy is something which is true about just everything in general. So this is not what sets God apart from creation, having essence and energies. But remember what I said about energies. Energies are relational because energies are directional. So uh, St. John of Damascus, I believe, uh, calls them the ecstasis of nature. So just think about, if you know a little Greek, ecstasis, ek, out of, from, stasis, um, stasis, so you're going out of yourself. You are moving in and through the energy. So let's talk about just um, an inanimate object, or what we would conceive of as an inanimate object. What does it mean to say that a blade of grass has essence and has energies? Well, my argument is that you don't have energies unless you have relation, right? Because you're talking about energies, you're talking about its motion. And if you're talking about its motion, you're talking about its motion in relation to something else, or else there's no category in which you can make motion intelligible. So what does it mean to say that a blade of grass has essence and energies? Blade of grass, it is a blade of grass. So that's its nature. That's its grassness, okay? Its grassness is realized in its energies, in its activities, you might say in its properties, or propria. Those things are very closely related. It's very hard to actually distinguish them at all. I'd say that propria uh, is a particular vantage point on the concept of energy. Well, what am I saying a piece of grass has an energy? Well, think about it. How do you know that a piece of grass is a piece of grass? Well, when you look at it, what's going on? That piece of grass is actually moving outwards towards you. Light goes into it. It's reflected back at you. The grass is pushing itself out of itself towards you. And you are seeing that green light because that green light is coming from the piece of grass and is going into you. And now there is a union established that uh, that light, which originates in the grass goes into you. And now you know it, you recognize it, you apprehend it as a piece of grass. And you also, when you see that piece of grass, you are expressing yourself in relation to it because your capacity to see things, seeing is an energy, it is a verb. You're looking at it. So you are pushing yourself out of yourself in the activity, the energy of sight. That is a quality, a power, a property you have as a human being. The grass is pushing itself out of itself in, the, uh, in its energy of uh, shining greenly, we might say. And then there's a meeting, a mutual indwelling, and that constitutes knowledge. Now, maybe you can understand more deeply the biblical term no. Why does it say that Adam knew his wife? Well, that's not a, 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 that's not a euphemism. Mutual indwelling. That's what knowledge is. That's what all knowledge is. The conjugal union by which God creates new human beings is a particularly exalted form of knowledge. Say Adam knew his wife is actually the deepest, uh, most literal expression of what's going on there. Not a euphemism which is concealing something. All things have energies because all things are relational. If we say that it is part of what it means for grass to be grass, that it shines greenly, well, then you need to have creatures who apprehend that greenness because they're constituted in relation to each other. Who am I? I'm Seraphim Hamilton. I'm the son of a specific parent. I'm the husband of a specific woman. All of those things make me who I am. They determine the mode of my humanity. So we are constituted in relation as is God. God is constituted in his mutual indwelling of divine person. So this is why we see God is perfectly and infinitely God, wholly apart from creation. 
wholly complete apart from creation. Creation is sheer gratuity, I think as Florovsky argues correctly. So all things are relational, all things are constituted in relation to each other, and the terms of that constitution are the energies. So it's closely related to the notion of the logi. So I hope you could begin to anticipate this in what I was saying about knowledge. Logi, what is a word? A word is a thing in personal communication. So when I said grass, so that word came out from my mouth, went into this microphone, it's being converted into electricity, and then it's converted back into sound, and it goes into your ear, and then what do you think of? You thought of a blade of grass. That image was in your mind. Somehow, me speaking that word out caused you to have the image of grass in your mind. How in the world did I do that? That is a absolute miracle that I think we should appreciate and thank God for. But it's rooted in God's very life. This is the kind of thing we're talking about when we say that Jesus is the divine logos. He is the person in whom God says everything about himself that it is possible to say. In fact, he is the person in whom God has been speaking about himself from all eternity. And thus he is the person in whom God speaks about himself to us in time. A word is a thing in personal communication. So grass has gone into me through its energies. And now I have a word for it. I have something which signifies it. And that word is attached to it. And then when I say grass, that grass which went into me goes into you. So now you see the way that creation flows into us. And when it flows into us, now we're sending it out towards each other. Why is it that corporately the human family comes to a deeper and deeper knowledge of the structure of the world? It's because the world is coming into us and then we are transmitting it to each other by language and we are together developing. But how is it that we get taken from development as creatures into the life of God? Only when we speak all things according to their relation to the only begotten Son. Only in the incarnation is the uncreated joined to the created in such a way that everything becomes an opportunity for our deification. So uh, this will be a two-parter. So that's what I'm going to wrap up with today. Uh, again, if you are interested in supporting this channel, please consider becoming a patron. You can also subscribe to my sub stack. Um, uh, all patrons get all exclusive Substack posts, by the way. Um, you can also sign up for Answering Protestantism from the Bible, Answering Calvinism from the Bible. I can bundle those for a discount. And Answering Judaism for Rejection of Jesus. Though I am also working on producing more free content like this. Um, I don't like monetizing anything. I really don't. But to be honest, I just have to if I'm going to eat and also provide for my family. So thank you all for listening. Hope this has edified you and I will see you again very soon.